Welcome back to the User Flows Podcast, everyone. My name is Thomas Morell, and this is a show where we talk about UX design and careers. I get to interview designers about their journey into the field and break down how they've been successful in their roles so we can all learn together. So today I'm joined by Jeffrey Paul Coleman. So Jeffrey is working to make tech more inclusive by supporting growth of the UX research community in Europe via UX Insights, which is really cool. Definitely want to get into that and advocating for recent grads, immigrants, and career changers uh, via the online bootcamp Career Foundry, which is super cool. Definitely want to get into that. And also running a small training program in NYC called DesignWorks. So lots of really pretty amazing stuff. Um, where do you find the time, Jeffrey? <laughs> well, thanks so much for having me on the show, Thomas. And um, while it does sound like a lot when, when put that way of like these three different things that I'm supporting, I, uh, one, am not part of uh, like the leadership of any of these organizations. Design Works is part of the Kingsborough Workforce Division, and there's a there's a team of others that I'm supporting. I just get to be the industry liaison, connecting the industry professionals with the students and with the university um, program, and then. For UX Insight, great team that I joined just recently, and I work part time for them. Uh, the director, Karen, has been working in the field for over a decade and uh, loves to give back to others. And I'm simply supporting her in uh, strengthening that community. So the sum of these three jobs, I'm a freelancer with Career Foundry, is never more than 30 hours a week. So that's helpful in terms of other things in, in life and being able to not feel overwhelmed by it. Just try to be very strategic in how I am helping out so that I'm not... Uh, getting getting lost in the weeds, so to speak. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it can be very tough to keep things to, you know, a specific amount of hours every month. So I'm glad to see you're trying to make time for everything else in life. It, it has to be intentional. Sometimes if we aren't intentional, we can blame other people, like saying a manager is overworking us or saying that a company uh, is asking too, too much of us, it's not fair. Uh, but if we set strong boundaries, which is uh, something that I'm actively practicing doing, then uh, we we don't blame other people because we realize what we can control. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's um, I have another podcast coming out, I think, this week with a woman named Ellie Millen. And one of the things she brought up a lot was boundaries as well. She's taking a career break so she can kind of set some of her own boundaries and kind of rediscover what she wants to really do with her design career. So I think that's a a good place for people to be (laughs) setting those boundaries, uh, realizing those boundaries are needed. So that's fantastic. Yeah, I think it's such an important topic in in this time with the uh, many stresses related to the pandemic and not related to the pandemic, but kind of brought up by it that uh, we have to take care of ourselves and setting boundaries is such an important part of that. Right, right. And so you were remote before the pandemic started as well? Or did you go uh, so remote after? Remote remote after. Um, okay. I, I, I feel like uh, the pandemic has kind of moved us all into like a new world. Um, mm-hmm. But I actually moved just a few months before the pandemic um, okay. was well known. I mean, it had already started in uh, December in China, and that's when we moved in December 2019. Actually, moved on uh, New Year's Eve to France oh, wow. from New York City, and um, we moved here because my partner grew up in France, and so we'd always talked about uh, balancing out our multicultural family by living here. And so we we make this move, and we're getting uh, settled in. Uh, I had a, a a role that had been set up for me as we were making the move. That didn't work out. I ended up doing a job search unexpectedly in the first few months, which was stressful, which then got also cut short by the pandemic. So then I was in a situation of, all right, um, well, I know how to connect with other people. And I know that I wanted to transition away from recruitment toward uh, serving uh, others in the tech community, specifically in UX. Mm -hmm. I'll just keep doing what I was doing. And I found that it wasn't all that different from when I was in New York. I'd be working in an office and I'd be connecting with people on LinkedIn and connecting with people by phone, mm-hmm. occasionally setting up meetings uh, to meet for lunch or coffee. But there was still like a lot of remote in that sense 
of the community building that I was doing. So this was simply uh, now making that more, more explicit. This is all the time and I'm working from uh, our home office. It helped that the whole world was going through it because then uh, when, you're, when you're filming from your child's bedroom, uh, other people don't think that's weird. It's now a normal thing. Yeah. Well, so that must have been a bit of a stressful time for you. Not only are you making a big move, but you were kind of switching careers and then throw on top of that this whole new kind of worldwide pandemic. That's, um, that's quite shocking. <laughs> How'd you kind of manage the stress of that one? It was shocking. Yeah, there was a lot of culture shock. And um, I, my, my partner is a very uh, outgoing, uh, transparent person. And um, that's something that attracted me when we first met nine years ago. I grew up being rather, well, I grew up um, in the suburbs of, of Philadelphia and uh, there people are, there's a more monoculture environment. And so I, I felt like there's like a script to behave and then there is, off script, but there's only those two choices. Then you're in New York and you realize you can do anything. But so when I'm coming to New York, I was a pretty shy person because I felt the way that I would want to show up wasn't the way that most people accept. And then I meet my partner who's so outgoing and like not self-conscious about how she is. Um, she is a very colorful person and uh, is constantly like thinking out loud, um, which uh, <laughs> when we first met each other, I was like, why are you doing that? You just told them that you're feeling depressed after having a baby, for example. Why would, mm -hmm. you, why would you tell that to other people? But I realized in that moment uh, this past spring when I was going through all that uh, cultural shock and stress that that's such a useful thing to be vulnerable with other people and to trust them. You don't just do it with anyone, with just strangers, for example. Mm -hmm. But I, I reached out to people in my network from New York, for example, that I built friendships with. And I would uh, talk through what the experience was and, and just explain it. And then I would reach out to other people that were family or friends and talk through other aspects. And that way I wasn't leaning on any one person, but I was able to uh, receive people's input and feedback uh, and the last thing I did was take a lot of naps because when you're dealing with that kind of stress and anxiety, you have to be kind to yourself. And um, napping has also been helpful in recent weeks as a new father. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Congratulations as well on oops, getting a little echo. Uh, congrats on being a new father. That's amazing. Um, it's, a, it's a big challenge. It's a lot of work, but it's uh, probably one of the most rewarding things you can do. Yes. I, I love being a uh, dad. Uh, yeah. You learn so much from your kids. Like during the first lockdown, we were watching a TV show um, that's called Shira. And watching this TV show, like I would never have given myself permission to watch that if I weren't a dad, but being a dad, I could watch it. And then I was like, wow, I'm learning so much about the tech industry from watching how these different princesses interact with the technology and with each other. And uh, I always wanted to recommend it as like, hey, if you work in tech, you should watch this TV show. It teaches you a lot about inclusion and also about how you can get easily manipulated by people who want power and so on. Um, yeah, uh, I love being a dad, it's fun. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I feel like one of the lessons I've learned from my kids is a creativity without fear, where when they're being creative, when they're trying something new, there's like zero fear to, you know, messing up or doing something silly or, you know, not getting something exactly right the first time. It's there's just, it doesn't even enter their minds. It's just like, I'm going to be creative just to be creative. Like there's no kind of thought to the end goal. It's just absolutely, absolutely. They, they don't. Uh, they get kind of trained not to fear to fail because they get permission, I think, a little bit as children to make mistakes. But um, that's that muscle being so strong, then, like you say, they just keep keep trying. They fall down. They get back up. They look foolish. They don't care. And uh, that's such a valuable thing in, in learning. Uh, 
a theory that I have that I've never researched intensely is if we adults have that similar attitude, uh, we can learn uh, at a similar at a similar pace. People say like, oh, you're lucky that your kids are becoming bilingual. Um, it's so much harder to learn a language when you're an adult. I think it's more we just feel shame around stumbling with our words in a new language, and that's what keeps us from learning. And um, that's what uh, I think can be so useful in a for a UX professional is that, that constant curiosity um, and uh, mm -hmm. being an expert is one thing, but but being willing to not be the expert like children do. Um, it's a good inspiration. I love that. I love that. And just kind of going back to your comments before about your wife being very outgoing. And I wonder if that's just a non US thing. My wife is from the Dominican Republic. And after having children as well, she went around and told everybody <laughs> about the, what is it? Uh, they call it postnatal depression, or I think that's the wrong word. But um, for them. Post, yeah. And I think her mother, like most people were like, you can't tell people that that's terrible. Like you don't tell them that, but she's like, well, I have to warn other women that like this thing can happen and you should know about it. So I think that is a good thing. And as you said, kind of talking through, you know, what you were going through as well, you know, just being open to talk to more people and totally transparent. I, I love that advice. It strengthened uh, a lot of connections that I had in ways I didn't expect. I don't know. I guess I thought they would, People would reject me if I talked about uh, stress, failure, negative things, because uh, they it would like bring them down or or make them feel uncomfortable, um, and they wouldn't want to be associated with it. But it ended up uh, strengthening connections because then other people shared uh, points in time where like they had wanted to get into UX research, for example, and they were failing to do that, so they were working at a restaurant and. I, I didn't know that that's what they were doing. I just knew that they were job searching. I didn't realize they had kind of given up for a time and done working in a restaurant or, or another telling me about how when they moved to a new country, and in their case, the US, it was so stressful the first months. And I guess I, I knew that in theory, but then you hear it uh, when it's relevant and you feel, oh, I'm understood, this person understands. And they also feel like, oh, now you've gone through that experience, but you have to tell them about the positive and the negative otherwise people just think that you live a charmed life which is sometimes what i think social media um projects <laughs> you're living yeah. all perfect lives no it absolutely does and i think that's an important thing for you know, junior ux designers to hear is that you know the transition from something else to a career in ux design isn't always a smooth road like you will hit some setbacks, you will hit rejection, you will get to a told no, you will, you know, feel that kind of imposter syndrome. But there is, you know, the more you share, the more you open up to people, connect with people, the more relationships you'll form. And eventually, you know, you'll hear that yes, and you'll, you know, feel a little bit more at ease kind of in your new career. So I like that. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, a false image we have of networking that it's like the person who is smiling real bright shaking everyone's hand and always knowing what to say and continually being successful that that is the good networker i think that that is someone who can be networking because they're confident in themselves and so they're willing to put themselves out there but uh that's that's like the the first thing that someone might do a smile and a handshake but then if they're good at networking then they're good at being vulnerable about themselves and not thinking twice about it, good at asking questions and listening, and then great at caring about the relationship more than just the transaction. What can you do for me? Otherwise, they're not uh, they're not truly going to be successful with with having a real network um, across the board. Right. right. So, so in the uh, the email exchange we had, you mentioned you know helping those who are less often helped as kind of your mission. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, how do you go from, you know, a career in recruitment to doing something like that um, and still, you know, providing enough for yourself to, you know, have a life and all that and without kind of totally selling out, I guess, well, that's the wrong word, but like doing something like where recruitment, where it's kind of much more focused on, you know, driving revenue, things like that, but you're 
basically how do you how do you make a career out of that for somebody who might be interested sure yeah i'll give a little back context on how i got into recruitment to start i had um moved to i was a book nerd growing up and i moved to new york because i was pursuing a master's degree in historical theology which uh you know leads to a lot of different career paths uh including being a professor um and i thought i will teach this to people but they will not know why it's relevant and i won't know how to make it relevant unless i step away from academia so i stepped away to learn more about different paths that people take in new york and um, in the process of doing that, I was a, a test prep instructor and also a staff member within a, a for-profit test prep company. Um, I, I realized that there were a lot of people not knowing their path, but um, also companies sometimes don't know their path. Um, like they don't know the technology and so they don't know other ways to think of a solution and they're afraid to lean into that. Well, realizing it, uh, being the ones like point that out, that doesn't really make other people feel so comfortable. Also, it's not the actual solution, it's just criticizing. So I decided that I need to learn more about technology and about uh, careers, um, if it was truly gonna be helpful to people. So that's how I got into recruitment because I wanted to learn more about technology and careers. And I thought, well, if I'm talking to them every day, uh, that should help with the learning. Um, ended up being very good at recruitment so then it became a kind of career um, and it does pay very well because companies are really desperate to hire the best talent um, but i didn't get into recruitment for the money as i said i got into it for the learning and so when i had gotten to a certain point where i really was learning a lot i wanted to move away from it and share that with other people um, it's the it's the case that a lot of times in the economy there are certain roles that get paid a lot of money um, sometimes those roles really do offer a lot of value and sometimes they offer value to companies, um, but they don't necessarily offer long-term solutions, even for companies. And I find agency recruiting um, sometimes is a short-term band-aid for a longer-term solution, which could be like better corporate culture. Um, uh, similarly then, I didn't want my own career to be built on short-term uh, thinking where a lot of people that do career coaching end up doing it with people that can pay for uh, career coaching and particularly like a leadership who can pay quite a lot for career coaching and then you can make that your your main thing and it's quite lucrative but um, I I have found that there's more than one way to think about a budget making more and more money is one way to think about it and uh, lowering your expenses being happy with like a simpler way of life is another. Um, so my partner and I have uh, been pretty good at keeping our expenses low. Some we were making um, enough money that we were saving a lot. And at that point I realized, well, if we're saving so much and uh, that's like a trajectory that's gonna keep going, that, that might not be the best way to use the time, which is another resource to think about. And so when I realized that, I realized I could uh, work 30 hours a week, be paying bills and still serving where I wanted to. The last element was just uh, coaching other people on, on this networking relationship building. I talked with a lot of different people. Um, every week I'd talk to uh, three to five people since last summer. And that's how I found these different contracts, letting them know what I was interested in doing. And um, so when I found those contracts, these are people that really understood what I wanted to do and valued it. And I felt really good about it but I was able to tell them that I had uh, successfully been a recruiter bringing in revenue. So they knew that that's not like a, a risky bet to bring in someone on this function that's less revenue generating. They knew I can generate revenue, but I wanted to do this service uh, oriented role. So I think that's how I've been able to balance doing what uh, is sometimes uh, hard to do. But um, I've seen people that that have a similar service mindset. Um, it's just, I think they, they move away because they, like me, wanted to learn new skills, um, not necessarily because it doesn't pay, pay the bills. I think it's a misnomer about service-oriented roles, like in a, in a nonprofit, for example, you can make enough to, um, if you're also thinking about minimizing expenses and being happy with, with your day-to-day.
Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I'm glad you got to do that. That's um, really interesting that you get to kind of follow, you know, your true passions and stuff. And you kind of, you went into something with the mission to learn, you learned what you needed to learn. And now you can use that to help in other areas and other passions. So that's, that's wonderful. My wife and I, um, she wasn't super happy in her career. So we just relocated recently to um, Savannah, Georgia, which is a much less expensive region of the country compared to, you know, New York, New Jersey. And that kind of helped her kind of go from, you know, full-time career right now. She's working part-time and trying to build up her own design business um, and get back into design, which she had left for a number of years. So I can definitely understand. And one of the big things we had to do as well is get our expenses under control and really kind of think about what we need, what we don't need. So we can live a little simpler life. So we don't both have to be, you know, pulling in full-time incomes, like, like crazy people. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so uh, useful to have, whether you choose it or it kind of falls on you, you're like forced into thinking about that, but uh, that kind of organic holistic thinking about your path is, is really a useful thing. I talked to, people who are uh, later in their careers as UX professionals, and they would be needing to make a certain salary, but then that made it challenging for them to be able to choose opportunities that fit their values. Um, and uh, if you only think that one way of, I need to make more salary, uh, then you have to be okay taking those other options that might be more stressful, but if you mm -hmm. think more holistically of the whole, uh, some, oh, we could reduce expenses or we could shift where we live or we could uh, adjust the dynamic in, in our family unit if you're in a family. It allows you for more possibility. Right. right. And kind of trying to stick to that one specific you know, salary requirement can kind of lead to what they call a golden handcuffs where you're kind of, you're stuck possibly doing something you don't want to be doing for forever just because you need to kind of maintain that one lifestyle. So that's interesting. I'm glad you got to do this. That's that's wonderful. Um, and so one of the things you mentioned as well is, you know, you work in the UX space in uh, kind of like a UX career in a way, but you don't consider yourself a designer. Um, you know, I, I want to try to you know introduce people to all the other types of possibilities within the kind of realm of UX that they could possibly get into if in fact, you know, they don't necessarily think they're they want to be a designer, but they are very interested in you know technology and design. Um, do you have any kind of advice for those types of people? Absolutely, because um, one thing that I often advise to people is talk to others to learn their stories, and not just one or two people, but learn a number of people's stories, and then you get to see a wider range of options. When I was recruiting, that's what ended up happening is I was talking to so many different people and realized there was no set way. Certainly there were people that say graphic design, then they learned UX design, and then they become a senior product designer um, in, a, in a majorly successful company. And, and then you only look at that and you think, ah, see, that's the path to go. You got to like study at a good university. And, but there were plenty of other people that were uh, working in completely unrelated fields and transitioned over. And there was many other kinds of roles besides just a senior UX designer, product designer. Um, and so that helped me in, in seeing the wide range because I didn't see myself as like a, someone who likes to draw growing up. I was much more of a writer. Um, and I also didn't see myself as someone who, who really takes like pleasure in, in being the one who built things. I like to connect ideas and connect people. Um, so when I've learned about uh, design ops and research ops, for example, uh, I've been really excited by those communities where as, as design teams mature, they have someone who is uh, helping with the coordinating, helping with the uh, standardizing of processes, helping with the advocating for tool adoption or uh, Doing, doing that long-term uh, evangelization for better uh, understanding of UX, for example. Um, I thought that that's really great. That's where I feel I identify with. Um, I saw that that is something that is growing in uh, different teams, but that also as an industry, there's a lot of growth of being rather new field. There's a lot of maturity across all UX. 
and um, sometimes people don't uh, they, they're kind of siloed into their different companies they don't have opportunity to talk through those bigger problems because uh, there's only like a, a conference here or there and different people show up to different conferences so there's not a, always an ongoing um, conversation and I, I thought well I like facilitating good conversation and I like connecting people and I don't have uh, a need to be in a certain company like have that brand beyond my CV mm -hmm. I would much mm -hmm. rather know that I was offering value to the greater ecosystem and that's how I found myself as a UX community builder is uh, just uh, noticing where there was a need and also recognizing in myself what I like to be doing. Um, after talking to lots of people, I knew what the options were better. Yeah, well, that, that's that's wonderful. Um, so UX community builder, I like the sounds of that. The role that you kind of described that you look for almost sounds to me like a design operations type of thing, which um, is fantastic and is definitely a growing field and aspect of UX. But what, um, I guess specifically as a kind of UX community builder, what are some of the things that you do on a, I guess, a daily basis? Yeah, so I, I think of myself a little bit like a design operations person across across teams or organizations like in the industry. So um, it, in specific teams, so for example, with uh, UX Insights, uh, they are a community that runs an event annually. Um, it's usually held in the Netherlands, but now with the a remote situation, it's been remote in 2020 and 2021, and uh, we'll see what next year brings. Um, I am helping them organize a second uh, event. Uh, so they usually are in the springtime, and we're doing a, now a second event because they have increased capacity. Um, and part of that means like helping find speakers, but also part of that means thinking about the strategy of, of the event itself, how it's going to be organized um what theme what uh what kinds of ways we want people to experience it are in will be november 11th um and it'll be about inclusive research we we decided that we do want it to be about practical things and so uh, not just about the importance and so it was like being part of the strategic conversations and then helping find the people that could talk about that um is also uh introducing people to one another. So whether that's within UX Insight, for example, or what I'll do is I'll be coaching someone via the online bootcamp Career Foundry. And I'll be, I'll be telling them like, it's really useful to be networking and not just applying to jobs. It can be so hard to face rejection after rejection after rejection and finding the right fit when you've just finished a, uh, uh, schooling, uh, whether that's through a university or through a bootcamp. Uh, that first that first job is hardest to find. If you do that alone, it's going to be so much harder. Uh, so when I say networking, not just messaging a hiring manager and asking if they have a job opening or like asking a senior level person if they would refer you, but having conversations to ex exchange stories. So I coach them on that. Um, but then sometimes they're like feeling a bit shy or I just think of someone I'm like, you know, you're coming from a, a background as an art therapist. And I remember there's this other person who had previously been doing uh, things in the mental health space and they're working now as a senior level person. I think I think you would get along. And so I introduced the, the two of them and that helps people feel like the world's smaller and they feel seen. And they know that like, if, if you're the only, the only one on a team, you don't feel you belong. But if you know that in the industry, there are many others that have come from fashion or come from architecture. Um, it's reassuring. And so that, that increases people's sense of belonging uh, in the industry um, and gives them then the strength to keep persevering. And the last thing that I, that I do as a community person is a bit of advocating um, senior level professionals and hiring managers. Sometimes they are only talking to other, their peers, others at a similar level. And so then opinions can form about boot camp education, for example, or they can um, be worried because they've been burned before about hiring someone that they're going to have to uh, educate and then that person might leave out of, quote, disloyalty. And so they're worried about taking that chance again. And if they only talk with peers who are also really busy because they're in that, that 
like height of their career, they might not work through that. So I talk through that, give them some other ways to think about it, and then advocate for uh, people I know so that it acts as a, a increase in trust. It's not just some random person applying, but hey, we know each other, we've established some trust. I'm not just saying this hypothetically, here is someone I think that uh, could be a great fit for your team or could be worth meeting. And so that kind of community work of um, introducing people to each other also. Yeah, no, I, that that's wonderful. I, I, that all sounds pretty amazing. It must be, I mean, a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment when you kind of connect two people and they form a you know, successful relationship. Everybody's happy. Everybody's, <laughs> you know, got what they need out of the situation. So that, that's perfect. Now, you brought up boot camps, which is um, something we talk about a lot on the show. I feel like most of the people I've spoken to on the show, and almost probably most of the designers I worked with in my career, went to some type of boot camp or another. I did a, a UX certificate, which is kind of like a boot camp through UC mm -hmm. San Diego. Through uh, Coursera, um, what are the concerns that you hear from, I guess, some design leaders around you know the people coming out of the boot camps and you know maybe some reluctance to hiring them? Well, for a while, one of the the things was simply a kind of unknown factor, where a lot of people in hiring positions had gone through degree programs, and uh, so they. They are meeting people from General Assembly, but they don't know a lot about the curriculum. One thing that um, boot camps have done better since is rotating in a lot of senior level professionals to be either mentors or instructors. So whether that person only works there for six months or for four years, uh, they get familiar with the curriculum and realize that it's a solid curriculum. So then there's a trust built. But the other is, since it is so intense, um, and uh, there's a wide variety of different students that come out of it. When you're dealing with an unknown, you can easily pick it on like, well, in, anecdotally, I met this one person and I thought it would be, uh, they'd be really great because of what the boot camp says, but they were not in really understanding the skills. Um, but uh, them not understanding the skills, that could be related to a number of different things. For example, some boot camps are focused more on UX uh, design. And the person's thinking about uh, how they know about design from studying communication design or uh, graphic design in a university years ago. So that's like two different educations, but they they have forgotten what they learned from that previous uh, thing. And they think the boot camp should have taught that to them. Um, so it's just a kind of amnesia about how people learn. Um, and then there's the soft skills as well that some people going through a boot camp will uh, have those soft skills from their previous career experience. So it's it's not like someone who worked in a restaurant will necessarily have the communication skills or someone that worked as an architect will not have so certain soft skills. It really depends on who that person was and how they worked. So it's not on paper, you can't know it. But uh, when they come out of the boot camp, they didn't learn the soft skills uh, very much because uh, it was so focused on the the skill set itself um it's only for a few months so then it can feel like someone lacks lacks certain quality uh because they're not able to explain themselves well or because they are have trouble uh collaborating with development teams for example and so that can give a, a bad reputation to boot camps even though it's not to blame um but i I have found that they do fill a really useful space in the industry as academia has moved slowly to um, move from the theoretical to the more practical and to create more of these programs with the hiring needs that exist. So I'm really glad they they exist and there's a lot of impressive people out there. Uh, yeah, no, that's yeah. wonderful. And so much like you, I mentor um, UX students at Springboard, um, pretty similar to General Assembly. And I would say probably one of the more difficult aspects of that is kind of coaching them on the soft skills <laughs> side of things. Um, do you have any, I guess, advice for coaching, you know, young designers through that, whether you're a you know, UX mentor or somebody in the position of, you know, employing other designers, managing other designers through, a, you know, their first few years on the job? 
Well, one thing that I have found to be helpful is being aware of the journey myself. Um, there's a lot of people that become successful uh, at design. They're now like a senior UX designer or even a principal staff design. They're like, I think I'll move to management. They move to management and they manage to do it because they maybe uh, had, a, had a friend who knows them and trusts them or the need was there for someone to be the manager and they're the most senior person. So they get put into it. That doesn't mean they have all the soft skills right there and they know it, but they want to hide it because they want to like stay as manager. Um, that is useful for internal politics, but not useful for coaching and mentoring. So if one can separate that out and say, humbly, I am still learning and growing and pay attention to what you need to be learning and growing, whether that's uh, learning how to do small talk or learning how to do public speaking or learning how to learn, like understanding how you motivate yourself to learn outside of just paying, paying for it um, in a structured way. But how can you like train yourself to learn these different things? Um, if you, if you pay attention to where you lack and don't feel intimidated by it and are like, consciously improving it, then you begin to like develop an internal um, curriculum. So then you can be able to say to someone, not only this is, this is ways to uh, improve that actionable ways, because you remember when you were shy and you're like, well, just try to, to meet a few people, talk to one or two people this week, or um, have, have you uh, met for, for coffee with, or, or met for a, a Zoom call with that developer to try and get to know them, them better. That might help with collaborating uh, later. Or have you come to your check-in meeting with your manager and uh, had a prepared agenda? Are you okay with them being stressed and therefore not being able to give you uh, feedback in that moment? Are you like, can you be kind to them that way? So you're able to like talk about tangible things because you know about it yourself. Um, and the mm -hmm. other thing that's great about knowing yourself is you can make it uh, less about like, I am the mentor, the expert, the senior person who's like, but you can make it more like we're learning together. And you could just like say, yeah, to be honest, you know, it's, I don't, I don't know how to do that uh, too. Let's learn, let's, let's make it accountability thing or, um, ah, yeah, you know, I might seem like I have it all together now, but when I, graduate and then you kind of reminisce and tell your own personal story and that makes it um, more uh, achievable for the other person when it comes to soft skills. I, think. I really like that advice. So kind of, you know, teach things by learning yourself and kind of, you know, internalizing it so it becomes part of your consciousness when somebody else has a question about it or you notice it in somebody else. Um, I think that's fantastic advice. And so you know, what would you tell uh, I guess a designer going through, you know, a pretty kind of tricky moment in their career. I know this is something that you um, uh, deal with, you know, maybe it's a toxic work environment or just a demoralizing year, like the past year that we all had. <laughs> um, how do you go about kind of coaching somebody through that and kind of onto their next, uh, their next journey? Well, one thing I, I do is I ask questions and I ask them uh, more detail on on the situation and that's not just for me to like dig in or like tr uh, try and understand it because i i might have talked to others who face a similar situation but i look for the words that they use to describe it and i take take real careful notes as i'm talking to them so like if if you had said that you um were, were feeling really burned out and stressed with with work i might be like oh yeah that's tough um, tell me, tell me more. What, what's been the situation? I, I guess you're like looking to take a vacation soon. It's summertime. You're like, no, I can't take vacation because my manager won't let me like, Hmm, what's the, what's the relationship you have with your manager? And so then you describe that more. And as you're telling me more of that, then I get, uh, more context, but also you feel listened to. And sometimes that itself, um, leads to the person finding a solution for themselves in that tricky moment. Um, the other thing I try and do is if they're talking through it and they they feel kind of like desperate, like what's wrong with me uh, or my situation kind of thing, I, I tell them stories about others, uh, anonymized of course, but I let them know, 
you know, it's been a hard year. A lot of people have gone through challenges with the pandemic. I've known people that their relationships uh, ended or they had to move suddenly or they haven't been able to be close to family or they've lost family members. It's been a really tough year and that's been so distracting for many people. When people hear that, even if they, they know it, when they hear someone else saying it, it can allow them to feel. Yeah, that's right, that's right. I'm not the only one. And uh, and then then some other things in their spirit kind of kick in where they remember, okay, I'm, I'm not as desperate as I as it feels. I'm not the only one in this. There are other people I can reach out to. Um, so those are two two ways that I help people navigate tricky situations. And uh, the last thing that happens is if if we've had a good conversation in those two respects, they're feeling heard and they're beginning to. Uh, realize it's not like the end of the world kind of tricky situation, but one that could be actionably gotten out of, then we talk about action steps. And I give uh, just a one or two tips on things they might, they might do um, as a kind of like experiment. Hey, why don't you try in the next manager meeting to bring up the fact that you would be more productive if you, if you were able to get some rest, that you are dedicated to the job and you love being there and so I give an actionable step and then get them to say, yeah, I'll, I'll then we set up a check-in time to see how that went. If it went well or, or they learned something from it, it doesn't need to be, um, that solves the problem, but it gets them started. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, you sound like you'd make a fantastic coach. So <laughs> love that. Um, so I know you went into recruitment, you said to learn, and now you're doing this whole new kind of UX design community building. You know, where do you go to learn more and to get inspired and yeah, yeah, to grow? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, when I was recruiting, I was inspired by the people I'd be talking to. Um, and I've found that um, I, I am consistently being inspired by the things that, that people are doing. Um, of course, there's content like podcasts and articles, uh, conferences, et cetera. But I find when I begin to know a person, whether them being uh, telling their personal story in the content, or uh, I actually get to meet them, whether I message them and compliment them on, on their uh, really helpful content that they made, and then we meet, or whether I've, I've met them some other way, um, I find that that can be really inspiring. But even people I, I haven't, met following their journey now that there's social media and so many other uh, ways that people can be just like transmitting what they're doing newsletters etc um there's there's people like um vivian castillo who castillo who um i've never met but she uh we were connected on on linkedin it, she recently created uh her own company leaving corporate uh, i think that's a really brave thing and she's standing a lot for humans centered design and um, talking about trauma, talking about uh, fear, talking about how, how to really bring ethics into design thinking and, and design teams. Um, I find that really brave and inspiring. Also, um, I, I read plenty. So I, I, yeah, I, I had the making of a manager by Julie Shjo, like really inspiring for like thinking about uh, ways to be a good manager. So many times we think that it's like uh, a black box of how to be a better manager. And it's like, oh, there are people that are, have shared what they did. You can read that and then get ideas. Or I'm reading right now, um, there's someone, Claire Evans, who, um, okay. Claire Evans, uh, she, she's a vice journalist and also a uh, part of a band. Um, but she wrote this book about uh, women who made the internet. Uh, and just talking about the history of, of tech, um, that's inspiring to me, realizing that's sometimes a gap. We think of tech as like innovation, newest thing, VR. Uh, oh, have, have, you, have you tried out uh, doing, doing design for AI? Have you gone to that event? And uh, remembering also there's a past of, the first computers and who who those people were the first computers and uh how software languages came about where people that were dismissed and kind of written out of history or secretaries um and then become the people using the machines and 
coming up with a language to uh, communicate to it, then you're like, oh, that's how it all fits together. That inspires me too. And um, yeah, even the people that I'm coaching, there's a person who I had been coaching through Career Foundry. And uh, I'm sure she would say that I was helping her. But when I see someone go from feeling a kind of frustration that they had been, she had been a successful teacher and art therapist, and then she became a UX graduate, but she was having trouble getting that first job. And she was used to having successful interviews, but it's, it's different in the UX industry when you're first starting out, plus the career change. Um, I was inspired that she didn't give up. She kept learning and uh, she emailed me just last week saying she got the full-time job for the company she'd interned with. It was beautiful. I was so inspired and I, and I uh, find that's where I get a lot of my energy is through these relationships with other people and what they're um, willing to, to do as they grow. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so where should people go to connect with you, um, get in touch? You could find me on LinkedIn for sure as a starter point. I find it can be a distracting platform, but I mean, that's how you and I uh, reconnected and then it can always share email from there. But so Jeffrey Paul Coleman, because there's a lot of Jeffrey Coleman's out there. So Jeffrey Paul Coleman um, on LinkedIn. And uh, I, was, I was thinking whether to uh, talk about this. There's a newsletter I started last year called The Bridge that, um, is sharing things on like intercultural communication, uh, personal and organizational development, and just remaining ever curious about the world. Um, and so I've been writing that every two weeks since last August, that's called The Bridge. And um, that's not something you can easily find online, but we could share a link in the show notes or uh, you can connect on LinkedIn and I can share it. Uh, if people wanna follow along there. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. please do. I would love to personally follow that. Um, a newsletter is something I've thought about doing for a long time. So congrats on doing it and, you know, sticking to a two week format. That's, I know that's a lot of work. Um, and also uh, share the UX uh, insights uh, conference link for November. Cause I think a lot of people listening to the show would love to be able to attend that virtually. I think that sounds fantastic. Yeah. We're, we're became really excited about the program. Um, and we'll uh, we already have, uh, one link that I can share promoting promoting it. And then in September, um, we'll be uh, announcing it officially uh, with the program and, and tickets and so on. So yeah, we'll be happy to share that. Perfect. Well, Jeffrey, uh, it was really nice to meet you finally in person and not just through email or LinkedIn. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself here. I really enjoyed having you on. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs>